So I think Tim and I are going to try and make the last session of the day highly entertaining. But actually why I really feel privileged is because of what I do day to day and it's actually working with a lot of you as customers in a time where technology is completely changing the landscape. And I look forward to looking forward at some stage towards retirement and appreciating all the things that I've been able to help businesses do in New Zealand to make sure we remain competitive. It's been traditional at this event for us to do a session where we really focused over the hill at what was changing, what the future was. Um, but the reality, Chris Olds left us and so is his colourful shirt. So I'm going to bring it back to a more practical level today because I actually have the view that the future has landed and actually it's time to take advantage of that rather than necessarily worry about what's coming over the hill. So this quote from Bill Gates has been around for a while but I want to put a different spin on it for you today. What I want to say to you is that if you're part of an executive, take yourself forward two years and if you look back and suggest that you overestimated what technology could do for your business, you've probably failed to act and take advantage of it. And actually that if you're thinking that in two years, your competitors may be thinking the complete opposite. And they will have made changes that have made them more sustainably competitive for the future. I hope some of you have seen this, this hype curve and really it's about kind of buzzword technology and capabilities that are coming through that are maybe going to prove to be successful and helpful to us at some stage. And often they fall down into the, the trough of disillusionment or, or hopefully go up the slope of enlightenment. But I would put it to you that technologies are starting to move through this cycle significantly faster than they were. At least the more mature and better ones. There's still some that probably aren't making it. And so for us, I look at this this year's example, and I actually see some technologies which we're seeing adopted very successfully right here and now. Examples of that would be IoT or Internet of Things, where we're working with customers to, do, to connect equipment and devices and other things so that we can monitor and manage those more effectively. And we've done great work with Coca-Cola Amatol, for example, dynamic controls of their electric wheelchairs and a whole range of other businesses to really add really differentiated competitive advantage to their businesses. If I then look at things like virtual assistants, and we've seen some today, and we're going to look at some of the work that AUT's done in this space, it's a really compelling place for us to look at because the future's going to be full of this sort of thing. And then we got onto data and machine learning and cognitive computing, and again, we're going to look at a few of those components today. But first I wanted to introduce AUT. AUT is quite special to me. I've studied there twice. I was around 20 the first time and around 40 the second time. I'm also running the MBA alumni for them and recently I did some lecturing there and really enjoy that so they're a brand that I connect with a lot and I guess they are New Zealand's youngest university and they talk about being the university for the changing world and that they realise that they can't be old and stale like the guys over the road, they've got to reimagine themselves and grow and be a bit different. And I love their mantra, they're really just aiming to have great graduates simple and effective way to focus their team around a purpose. And actually a great graduate is about giving them an experience as they're coming towards AUT, through their time at AUT and as they leave AUT. It's the experience on campus, it's that learning experience, but it's also that social environment at Vespar in Auckland potentially meeting lifelong friends who will still be their colleagues in many years to come. So we started our journey with AUT 18 months ago. And it was fair to say, as they selected us as their strategic CRM partner, we found that their, I guess, belief in CRM was a little bit behind where we wanted it to be. It was fuzzy, and that was the word they used. And really it came down to the experience of doing a number of projects with CRM over probably the last decade that had never really delivered on the hype and expectation. So at Intergen we have a thing called Thinking Forward, and Thinking Forward is all about the idea of our staff not being satisfied with just doing what they're asked, but actually thinking for you and with you about what the risks are, and where we can really take things if we ratchet it up. So that was a big red flag to our guys, the idea that you know, people didn't understand CRM and we were worried we would just go through and do a technology project that underwhelmed again, and that's not good enough for anyone these days. So we worked with the senior team and the leadership within IT and the business and said how can we actually be really clear about what we're doing and bring this together? And I guess what we wanted was some sort of strategy and understanding to hook this in behind. So as you do, we got out the sticky notepads and we did a big workshop, probably about 25 of us, representing the allied or, or I guess administration staff, the brand and marketing team, some academic folk, Māori and Pacifica representative, and really trying to bring together the idea of us all sitting around a table and thinking about and representing what a student journey looks like. And how it feels when you're trying to select an institute to go to. How it feels in that week one, year one experience, which is really hard and a really good time where you have to kind of get in alongside these people. But actually, at what point do they start thinking about leaving and what it means to them in their career moving forward? 
And we used five personas to do this, but pretty quickly realized that actually they had 27,000 full and part-time students. And whilst personas were a good mechanism to have the conversation, it's actually about knowing the individual aspirations and dreams about each of those individuals. So what we came up with is what we call the Kauri tree. And this is a great representation of AUT's student experience that they want to, want to provide. It's very much aspirational. They've done an amazing amount of work today, but they really want to push the boundaries on this. And the aim of this was to become a conversation point and a way to connect their staff with the vision that they were trying to present and trying to follow. It wasn't just about CRM that we were doing. It wasn't just about the award-winning digital hub that AUT had put in or artificial intelligence or learning analytics. It was about the on-campus experience, the social element of being at AUT and all those components. So I wanted to talk you through this because you'll appreciate a little bit more about why the technology tools are really necessary to provide this sort of experience. So let's start at the bottom and think of the concept of the sort of ground and the roots reaching out into the community. So AUT is very active and involved at college. They've probably been out to talk to some of your kids at the 12, 13, 14 years of age to create curiosity and get them engaged in the thought of going to higher education. They also work actively with the South Auckland Refugee Centre and lots of lower decile schools to try and get people to understand there is a gateway for them and support for them to be successful. And hopefully reaching down brings more of them to that first stage of hopefully wanting to become enthusiastic about studying. Then the hard bit begins. They've made that commitment and they've got that three or four year journey through their study. And the, the trunk of the Kauri tree really represents the strengths of the AUT experience, predominantly focused on being on campus and being engaged because it's a very social and collaborative process. But we all know is when we go to university, you know, those early stages are really difficult. We've sort of got orientation, but actually we need help at times. And actually, a student might get halfway through and realise they want to branch out, and that's represented in the trunk with a little branch out there that, actually, I've realised the course I'm doing isn't about me. It was what my parents wanted me to do. I have no passion for it. AUT, can you help me find something or take me where I want to go in my career? Or that gnarly knot that's within the tree where our students are having a really difficult time of things, and AUT needs to be at its best to really help them through. And ultimately, how AUT starts thinking about not just graduation, but actually what happens after that, and connecting the individual with the sort of networks that are appropriate for them. Because it's actually not just about walking across the stage and getting that parchment, it's about what they do with the knowledge they've gained. Are they going to be a job maker or entrepreneur in the market, or are they going to be a job taker, or work in academia or social services? And that they all go out and do the wonderful things they do in the community, but actually that those leaves drop back down and propagate the next students like I will with my children about my AUT experiences, or to my colleagues who maybe inquire about whether an MBA has been valuable to me. So I guess the aim of this for us, and it really helped our team understand, what does it look like when it's really working? Because then we can actually show leadership and not just do what we're asked. With that, I'd like to introduce Tim Davison to come up and talk a little bit about business intelligence at AUT. Cool. Oh, well, that's pretty loud. Um, thanks, Steve. Um, so, yeah, I work in the strategy and planning team within AUT. So we're a tiny little team. We've got about 12 people, and I thought we'd just start off with a picture. Um, so this is us. I'm the big giraffe in the left-hand corner there, as you can see. Um, and we're all dressed in pink because this was Pink Shirt Day um, last year. So it's like my favorite day in the AUT calendar. Um, and we have like thousands of staff and students who all come, uh, come to the university, drink in pink. Um, and it's a day run by the Mount Mental Health Foundation um, to raise awareness about bullying. Um, we do all sorts of kind of fun stuff. We have a barbecue, which all the staff and students come to, and we have pink cupcakes and pink drinks, which are the best. Um, and it's really cool. Um, also, um, part of the team over here is our student services area, and I guess some of the cool stuff that I'm going to show you today, um, I want to say a little shout out to them as well because I'm a bit of a loose cannon and I've got all these kind of crazy ideas, but I struggle to get things implemented. So over the last year or so, we've been kind of working close together and actually getting some of the stuff across the line, doing the tricky bit, which is actually getting it implemented. Um, so before we get started, I was just going to quickly talk to you. Oh, that's not supposed to come up about our BI journey at AUT. Um, so it probably all started about six years ago when um, the university decided it wanted a strategic business intelligence um, program. Um, and we brought in some, some external help. Um, and they spent about a year at the university 
And after the year, we kind of had this 500-page document, which was a, a roadmap for the next 10 years, um, and a single-source data warehouse, which had a cube and stuff over the top of it. And I don't think the university was too, too impressed with that, so things kind of went a bit quiet after that. Um, and at the time, I was working as a lonely little developer in the corner by myself, building the university's forecasting system. Um, but I was kind of interested in this stuff. And I heard this rumor that our deputy vice chancellor was trying to prove this correlation between student success and student satisfaction. And he had no way of doing it, so he had this big pile of annual program surveys from the students and, and completion rates from some of the papers. So we kind of went up and said, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Vice Deputy Vice Chancellor, sir, um, we've got this idea, we can probably create something for you. And we put together this ugly thing. <laughs> um, and this is when Windows 8 had just come out and the Metro interface was cool and stuff like that. Um, and basically what it was is a, is a tool build in Excel um, which allowed him to come up here and look at papers that weren't performing so well and then get a whole lot of information about the students that were in there. So what their satisfaction rates were, gender profiles, age profiles, ethnicity, deprivation, etc. But this thing never worked properly. It was slow as a dog. Um, but he absolutely loved it. Um, and I think probably it would have been yeah a couple of months after that, our vice chancellor came back from Australia, um, and he'd been at Deakin or QUT or one of the one of the universities over there, and he came back with his A4 sheet of paper which had a whole lot of KPIs and measures and stuff on it, and he said, those those lads who built that colourful thing, the students at Cestel, can they build me one of these? Um, and we said, absolutely, um, and. <laughs> This is what we came up with. This was the school scorecard. Um, and the cool thing with this is he required data from multiple systems right across the university. So this included like student profile information. There was stuff about staffing in here, research. Um, there was the student experience stuff, which included satisfaction rates and completion rates, um, and some financial information as well. So suddenly we had this really cool mandate, which is like, this is the vice chancellor's initiative. We need your data. Um, and we went across the university and got all this data. And this was the start of the data warehouse. Um, we don't use this anymore. This was quite a few years back. Um, but we've just kind of gone from strength to strength. And now we have, I think, I don't know whether it's official or not, but I'm just going to say it anyway, um, the, the most comprehensive data warehouse um, in, in Australasia and in the tertiary sector, which has about 50 different source systems coming into it. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. And I think one of the interesting things in talking to Tim is Tim works in strategy and planning, not IT. And actually, Tim, explain what that really means in terms of your ability to sort of be free and get on with things. Um, yeah, I guess I mean, we have a very large IT shop in, in AUT. I think there's probably about 180 people in it. Um, but because there's only about three of us, if we have a, have a great idea, and we have lots of great ideas, <laughs> um, we can just start work on it straight away and there's, we don't have to fill in business cases. And, and so, sometimes it works, sometimes it's not a, a good thing, but it's kind of, I think it's worked for us in general. So it's a great example of what I call table stakes, the fact that AUT puts some table stakes or investment in a small team to innovate and maybe not without the normal governance and structures that are appropriate for more enterprise IT technology and systems. So artificial intelligence, and you've probably heard a little bit about this today, and I guess for me, we talked about technology being the big game or the important piece in town. I think this is one of the biggest components you all need to think about because it's going to automate tasks and the way we get information across a whole range of sectors and industries. But it's actually pretty hard. There was a study done in Australia recently where they canvassed the public, and the public's feedback is, yeah, we're fine talking to a bot so long as the experience is as good or better. And that's the bit we've got to work on and which is not easy. And so I guess what I had to do before I sort of uh, looked at what Tim had done at AUT is do a, my own bit of research. So um, Drew Assist is the Domino's pizza um, app. And, and I guess I thought, you know, with different industries, AI promises different things. In some cases, it's simple and discreet. And in other cases, it's quite complex. So as part of my research, I got some technical assistance from my son, Jack, because he's quite good with this sort of thing. And, and we took about ordering a pizza. And I tried to do it entirely for a conversational interface for a bot. First, I might try that. I did have to resort to the keyboard a couple of times. We got through it. The pizzas arrived, and Jack and his mates were really happy and, and fed, which was great. And so then I thought, what else can I look at that's already out there? And I turned up with Oscar the bot. And I think this is an interesting, because Ian New Zealand's kind of said, hey, he's in training, so don't have high expectations, which is not a bad way to start, given what I said about better customer experience. And so again, you can get on there and look at air points and baggage and lounge information. They haven't quite got to flights yet, but hey, it's going to happen. And after doing that, I sat back and thought, well, then there's AUT. So AUT has five different faculties, 
graduate, postgraduate, doctorate courses, probably some other things they do with business as well, let alone that student journey we talked about where AUT wants to reach well before a student arrives and right through to alumni. And then there's all of the sort of the, the support services in terms of student success, the social clubs, getting to the best bar for happy hour, and all those important things. And as a bot, my head was exploding at this stage. So Tim, tell us about your journey, because you've been playing with this stuff for what, three years now? Yeah, yeah. we, um, we started when Cognitive Services and Microsoft was still called Project Oxford and created a, a bot that tried to do everything called Nina. Um, and Katrine down there from Microsoft actually gave us an innovation award for it. But it was, it was great for the award, but we never actually managed to implement it at AUT. We just tried to do way too many things. Um, and yeah, it was cool. It did some cool things, but yeah, it, it could have worked a lot better. So, so where did you go from there then? I guess what you're trying to say is Nina was trying to boil the ocean and therefore someone interfacing it wasn't sure how to find their way, I guess. So, so what's the approach now? Yeah, the approach now is that we've created kind of multiple bots and multiple layers of AI where we'll create these kind of conductor layers where somebody will go in there and they'll try and work out the intent of the question that, that the user's asking and then pass it off to another bot. So the experience for the user is kind of seamless. They don't realise that they're actually talking with multiple bots, but um, it just makes it a lot easier and so much a, better experience. a bot to manage all bots. Exactly, is that how it yeah. works? Great. Well, Tim, I know that you've got something you want to show us now. So do you want to set up and uh, show us how things work? Sure, sure. So... Um, I'm going to really simplify this, but say so there's, there's, in my mind anyway, there's, there's two types of applicants that we get coming to AUT. Um, there's the, the ones who are like, I don't know, they're super engaged at school, right? They kind of know what career they want, they know what program they're probably going to enroll in, they've investigated all the universities, they're doing the right subjects at NCEA because they know what they need to do to get into that program. Um, they come to our open days. And then there's the other type who, they're probably doing okay at school, and this was totally me. Um, doing okay at school and, you know, they, they, need, they need to know they need to go to university and mum's kind of nagging, have you applied places yet? But the thought of kind of applying at lots of universities and filling in those big forms and the correspondence going backwards and forwards is quite daunting. Well, not daunting, yeah. <laughs> um, so we thought, how can we build something um, that would work for those types of applicants? Um, and this is what we came up with. This is, this is AUT Nina. So imagine if you were that type of student, right, and you could, you could Basically, enroll at AUT, like a, a, the, a bot could kind of assist you with choosing a, a program. Um, it could enroll you, and it could even give you maybe a provisional offer of place in the university. All without having to download an app, without having to go to the website, without having to fall in a billion trillion forms. Um, you could just do it all instantly. So I'll just give you a demo of how this works. Um, it's not currently implemented at AUT, but we do hope to have it up and running within the, within the next few weeks. And we think that will be the first university in the, in the world to allow this or to do this. But that's just through from checking Google. Um, Google's always right. Um, so basically you start off, you just come in here and you'd say, recommendation tool. So it'll just take a few seconds to warm up, hopefully. It's just running on our test environment. Hopefully this works. Um, so it's come straight in and it said, you know, welcome Tim Davis into the AT study recommendation tool. Um, you can watch some videos about AT to start with or you can just go, let's start. And so the first thing I'll ask you is what do you want to be after graduate, after you graduate? And I'm going to type in something here. Um, so Nina's come back and she's saying, we've got a, a Bachelor of Business um, and we have a major in Accountancy. Um, so you have some options here where you can get some more information, it'll take you through the website and kind of give you the specifics. You can say, ah, oh, that's not really for me, I want to search again. Or the cool thing is you can come in here and you can say, oops, apply now. Um, so I'll just quickly take you through this. It's saying, when do you want to start? Um, all applications to 27 are currently closed, so we just say it's 2018. Um, what semester do you want to commence study in? Semester one. Um, do you have NCA level three or do you have university entrance? Yes or no? Um, so even if, even if you don't currently have it, you can say, I probably will have it, because this is only a provisional offer based on the information you're giving us. And do you know your national student number? No, I don't. And then it's just coming back, confirming these are the details. So it's missed one, yes, no, my name, my email address, all picked up from Facebook. Um, the program automatically populated and my major automatically populated. Are you happy with all of that? And then I'm just going to have to type in. Yes. 
And she'll have a bit of a think about it. And congratulations. I have a provisional offer. I'm an AUT. I can share it. I'm done. I can go and have a beer with my friends now. Fan fantastic, Tim. And that's like the lemonade of enrolling in university. And, and I think Tim said what they do next is they can share it on Instagram or whatever the kids do. And all their mates will be on enrolled as well just so they can hang out at the Vespa. That's fantastic, isn't it? It totally is. Oh, marketing alongside that all. Hey, so you're going to talk a little bit about the graduation app, which I think is live or next day, 24 hours? Um, yeah, on. so there's another one I can just quickly show you. Um, we've got graduation coming up in December. So I think, how many, we've got about 3,000 students graduating? Four and a half thousand, four and a half uh, students graduating. So during that time, our student hub would probably get completely overwhelmed with all sorts of questions like, you know, can I wear my hair up and can I wear jandals and can I do this and can I do that? Um, so we thought, how about we just send um, or give, give the, the graduates access to, to a bot this time. So I'm just going to jump tent here. Oh, she's already throwing shade. <laughs> Um, so this is one, this is just sitting on a landing page at the moment, but it'll be embedded into our, into our website. Um, hopefully. Yes. So it's just questions about the big day, so it's kind of, you know. Um, questions about what do I wear and you could go in and you could say what color do I wear based on the program they're doing um, anything else and I get extra and you can see there's these cool kind of follow-up questions here as well where it said there's tickets and it mentions um, AATS Centre um, and it, you've kind of got following questions like where is the Centre, can I buy flowers, that kind of thing. Um, it has things like maps embedded in there. Oh. So she didn't understand that one but she's come back with some other options saying where do I need to be for the procession. I said where do I meet for the procession. And you've got cool things like kind of Google Maps that you can just pop open on your phone. So, so, it's an of that. so probably a great little example, Tim, of grabbing a quite discreet piece, which, as you say, overloads the student hub and the support team around questions that they probably get sick of answering as well. And having stood around at graduation and tried to get organised, there's a bit to get your head around. And if you don't get organised, it's not so great because you don't get to pick up your parchment on stage. So one of the things we talked about is, is, is I look at this bot stuff and it's black magic to me because I'm a non-technical person. You keep telling me it's quite easy, which is great. Uh, but how about once you sort of deploy the bot, how does the business kind of work with it and take advantage of the tool? Yeah, so a, a good example of this is we've just created this other bot for our hospitality services team. Um, and it was just, it's a really, really basic Q&A bot um, where somebody who's in a, in a conference can go in and say, you know, what's the next session? Um, are there vegetarian options available for lunch and, and the like? So we basically created the, a kind of a really simple framework for it, which probably only took a couple of hours. But then with Microsoft Q&A Maker, um, you can just give them access to, to this here where they can just whack in a whole bunch of questions um, and there's um, answers to each one of those questions here that are surfaced up within the bot. Um, the AI kind of fills in the rest, so if there's words that are kind of similar to others, like synonyms and stuff, it handles all of that for you. Um, but it means that we don't need to get involved in any of that stuff, they manage it all themselves. Fantastic. So it gets it mobile and gets it out in the business and used. Excellent. Hey, so moving on to learning analytics, and I guess, you know, when I look at this area, one of the things that I took away from Envision, and I attended with Tim and, and Liz from the team at AUT, is we had all these executives getting up on stage, and they talked about two things primarily, the first of which was empathy. And hang on, this is a tech conference, but hey, it was a tech conference for business users. And I guess what they are emphasising is that there needs to be empathy for the people involved in these changes, whether it's students, customers, or your staff. And you really need to think hard about how it, I guess, embellishes the lives of the people around you and how it works. And I think you know, AI is a good example where if the bot's not empathetic, we can run into some trouble. But actually also how you use the data in a morally and, and respectful way would be another example. 
The second element was around data itself and that the foundation for digital change and transformation was getting your data estate in order. Because actually then you know what you've got and you can find some insight and you can kind of play an experiment but you can also measure success more effectively and hopefully gain that wider business engagement and adoption. So I, I guess what we want to do now, Tim, other than my quick question to you is that we at Intergen have been saying for quite a while now that actually it's never been cheaper to collect data and store data, so actually just get on and do it. I must say the accountant in me, and that's all well, I didn't like that little pun earlier, uh, is, is yeah, I need to know the why typically about doing things. I'm maybe a bit more historical, maybe a bit waterfall, and therefore it's hard for me to take the idea that we just forget the why and just start grabbing stuff. So, so how did it work for you? Yeah, we kind of had this, uh, this policy early on that if the data existed and somebody made the remotest offer that we could have it, we'd be like, yep, we'll have it. Even if there are people like, why do, why do you want that? We're like, we have no idea, but we just want the data. So we ended up with this massive data warehouse. But I guess, kind of following into what I'm going to show you next, that's kind of, that kind of gave us the ability to, 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 to build this. Um, so this is learning analytics. And basically what learning analytics does is tries to predict um, or identify the students who may not be successful in their studies early on so that you, we can run interventions and stuff like that. So the way it works is you have um, basically a whole lot of known indicators that we know about the students before they come in. So how, how well they did in the NCA, um, what school they went to, um, any deprivation stuff, were they first in family? Um, also things like, you know, when did they actually apply? Was it kind of early on or was it a last minute application? So all of that stuff in its own right is somewhat predictive, but when you start adding some of the engagement data, that's when it gets really interesting. So this is stuff like, are they using the library? And are they using the learning management system? So that's where they log in and download their course notes and ask questions from their lecturers and um, post in forums and stuff like that. Um, and the other most important one is attendance. And you know there's all those studies being done that students who attend class tend to pass. Um, <laughs> but the problem we have, the problem we have for learning analytics is that um, we don't have any attendance data. Um, so some lecturers will write down attendance on the back of a napkin or they'll have it in an Excel, dodgy Excel spreadsheet somewhere, um, but the university has no central repository for attendance data. Um, so, because we had all this data in the data warehouse, um, we had stuff like Wi-Fi utilization, we had all the Active Directory logs, we had things like kiosk use, we had things like library use. And so what we did is we looked at kind of all these events that are created when a student is physically on campus. So that's their phone connecting to Wi-Fi. That's them logging into a computer or printing a document or something like that. Then we compared the timestamps of those events to their scheduled class times. And if those times kind of fell within close proximity, you know, give or take an hour, we marked them in attendance for that class. Um, we could do more exciting things, like we could have used their location data through Wi-Fi, but we're trying not to be too, too scary. <laughs> or creepy is probably the better word. Um, this is just a little bit creepy. <laughs> Um, and then anyway, so that, that attendance data, the learning management system data, um, the library data, um, various ICC services data, and the known stuff all goes into machine learning. And on a daily basis, we predict, well, we generate a score against each student for each paper they're doing on how likely they will be to complete that or pass that. Um, and so the model's pretty good. It's kind of like a, in about week four of the semester, we've got a fair idea about what's going on. And then that enables like student services or our bots to run interventions with that. So what was this one all about then, Tim? Uh, this, yeah, I probably should have mentioned this. <laughs> this was just a bit of fun that we did with our digital footprint attendance data. Um, and one of the statisticians at AET just did some segmentation over it. So you can see over here, um, there's five groups over here. The, the gray one is the no standard standard one, which is kind of, you know, they start off pretty well and then they just kind of drop off. Um, this, the next one, which is the blue one across the top, you Steve? Yeah, it was me last time I studied. <laughs> Maybe not at college, Tim, but let's not talk about that. That's, <laughs> that's the teacher's pet. Um, this is totally me, which is the OMG exam time. So, you know, I kind of started off okay, then I, I don't know, I got lost somewhere along the way, but revision week came around, I was like, oh crap, better get in and learn that. Um, the late bloomers, um, those are a lot of our international students fall into this category because they're yet to arrive in the country or they're sorting out visa issues, etc. cetera. Um, and the, where's the campus? I don't even know what's going on there, but they're, they're just never here. I expect they know where the bar is by the looks though, Tim. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a very sensitive version, but this kind of is um, some Power BI um, visuals of, of how it actually looks. So this would be kind of like um, a lecturer could come in and they could see what the attendance rate is and some of the various things and who's going to pass and, and what. Then they kind of, so that a whole lot of the stuff's been removed. This would be a kind of a dashboard showing students um, for that particular paper. 
and the likelihood of them being successful, you can link out and see kind of full dashboards because it may be that they're doing kind of poorly in one paper or good in one paper, but there are other papers there may be some issues there. Cool. Thank you, Tim. So this whole machine learning and BI stuff to me is a black box and it seems very technically hard but you keep telling me it's getting easy which is good to hear for, for all the customers in the room. Um, but I guess what I really liked when we were talking to him is, is you showed me an example of how you present this technically complex stuff in a very simple way. And I'd really like you to share with the audience how that works and just give them an idea of how you're trying to make it really easy for people to adopt and take value from what you've created. Yeah, um, I'll show you the top. I was just going to say is like, you know, you don't need to be a data scientist to do machine learning more, and I'll give Microsoft another plug here, Katrin's smiling. Um, but using something like Azure ma Machine Learning, it's kind of like drag and drop data science, really, for basic stuff. Um, and even I give it a crack, I kind of bring it in and I'll show our statistician, and she's like, oh, it's okay, Tim, yeah. But it's, you know, it's, back in the old days, trying to do stuff in R, it would be next to impossible, so I haven't learned the whole language. But an example would be, um, we used to, um, have on our intranet, which was an old version of SharePoint, a site that we called the Reportal, and that kind of had all of our reports and everything into it. But the problem with that is that you'd need to know what you're looking for, and the reports had re weird file names, and it was just really confusing, and nobody could ever find what they were looking for. There was thousands of reports in there. So what we started doing is creating these kind of, I guess, like kind of portals within Office 365 that are um, fully tailored for one specific area of interest in the university. So this is our missions area. Um, there's no complicated report names or anything in here. There's just five simple headings in there. Um, and that's, I need more students. What's going on outside AUT? So what are our competitors up to? Um, I need to know where the issues are and what may the future look like and what um, are we doing, um, how are we doing attracting applicants? Um, so behind here, there's all sorts of smarts. So for example, I need more students. This uses Azure Machine Learning. Um, to, as somebody, when somebody applies to AUT, we run it through a machine learning model which tries to predict the likelihood of them converting from an applicant into an enrolled student. So that if you've got a whole heap of people through, like we do at the moment, we've just opened our online applications to every single country in the world for the first time. So there's heaps and heaps of stuff coming through. A lot of people just tend to go and apply to 20, 30, 40 universities across the world. So the models are actually kind of filtering out the noise and saying these are the ones you should be focused on and trying to get them to convert. Um, so the site's kind of like a nice kind of like magazine layout. There's pretty pictures and all sorts of stuff. I love pretty pictures. And it's pretty hard to show on the screen, so I won't go into it. But basically, somebody can just come in here and say, I want to look at the applications that were received yesterday. And all the applications that came in are sorted from most likely to convert to least likely. Um, and they can jump in and, and do other things. Fantastic, Tim. And I guess that's just a good example of a tool that's really helping AUT pick or pick the next best action and where to focus and each faculty to really drive the enrolments they need to. Um, Tim shared another one which uh, he's not going to show today, which was the idea of someone being on the web and where they got caught up in the process. So you can kind of work out whether that's a design error on the website or whether you need to intervene and reach out and, and help with that student. So just coming back to the idea about the, the data scientists, look, a couple of years ago, every other customer we talked to was asking, do they need a data scientist? on board and I guess for me I'm hearing we have kind of data science on demand in that Azure service area and you've kind of shared that so I'm interested in your experience with the fact you do have a statistician on the team but what it actually takes to kind of get this stuff going and, and what the skill sets and effort are involved in the likes. Um, I reckon uh, as I just mentioned before as well we, we use machine learning and I just kind of watched a few YouTube videos to, to work out how to use that um, but um, the tricky bit really with a lot of this stuff is is kind of the data prep um, and making sure you know the data is nice and clean, and you've got, I guess, the correct measures and your data sets and everything else. So that's that's kind of where it, the big effort comes into mm. it. And you mentioned there's a data cleanup tool that Microsoft's putting in place. Do you think that's going to help you guys moving forward with that task? Potentially, yeah. I've got to watch a few more YouTube videos on that one. <laughs> <laughs> True millennial, eh? That's how he learns. I love that. Um, so I guess the other thing I want to ask you: What's next for AUT? What are the things that you're excited about that are coming up? Um, something um, I was just over at in Orlando um, at Microsoft Ignite and Vision over there. And something that's obviously really huge is IoT. Um, so we've built this amazing new building at AET. Well, it's almost built, um, which is jam-packed full of sensors. So there's seismic sensors, sensors in there and temperature and all sorts of stuff. Um, so that's kind of our, our next big exciting thing to run that all into the Azure um, Internet of Things hub um, and do some kind of real-time stream analytics. I'm using machine learning, do real-time machine learning over the top of it. So. 
Fantastic. And I know you've got a bit of an interesting in blockchain. Where do you see that coming into play in the university environment? Wow. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, blockchain is going to be massive. Um, we were thinking about how we could use it, um, maybe since we issue qualifications as, as a repository for kind of storing those, um, and hopefully other universities getting on board with that as well, so that as employers have, you know, got some way of actually verifying them. Fantastic, thanks Tim. And I guess when it comes to CRM, I look at the sort of things that Tim's doing and, and what he's effectively creating is a bunch of potential alerts that we need to act on. So the idea that we can take that insight and pot potentially grab that as a campaign in CRM and, and take some interactions, record those interactions back through that data warehouse so we can correlate interactions with outcomes. And to me that's where the gold is because that's the return on investment for the interaction, the insight and all the pieces we pull together in a closed loop. But you take that further and you consider a student who's kind of sitting on the edge and hasn't quite enrolled yet, and the idea of maybe A-B testing, maybe someone from student services who can ring up and give them a great explanation of how campus life is like, what the accommodation is, what it's like living in Auckland, versus a lecturer who's going to bring that learning experience to life, and potentially looking down the track and knowing which of those options had the best conversion rate. Or if in fact you correlate back to find that some students don't care so much about what the lecturer has to say and where the bar is, and vice versa. So I think that's the sort of thing which I see really adding immense value of CRM as a platform for that structured follow-up and activity and alongside that business intelligence capability. So I guess as a bit of a wrap-up is, is what I've been hearing from Tim and others that I've been talking to, I guess when we, we look at AI, it is an interesting and new space. There's a certain bar we have to hit which is it's just as good as the other experiences that person would get for another channel, if not better. But actually, I'd encourage you to have a go because actually it's not technically difficult to get started, but just pick where you're going to approach it and get going with it. Because if you're not, the cost to serve benefits you're missing out on are what your competitors are banking and it may have an impact on your success in the long term. When it comes to data, I've got to give up on having to know the why up front and you should go out and consider the data sets in your business that you should bring together. Get that data estate in place because that's the platform for digital transformation and I heard it over and over from people in very, very large businesses who had a much bigger exercise to clean up their data estate than maybe some of your businesses do. So Tim, you also have a sort of a, a mantra within the team as to how you work. Would you mind sharing a little bit about how you guys do stuff? Yeah, this is how we do stuff. It may be a little bit controversial, but it seems to work for us. Um, is we have these kind of five pillars across here, which are our vision, our strategy, what we do at documentation, speed, and selling and sponsorship. Um, so probably I'll just touch on a couple of things because I think we're a bit short of time. But on the vision side, we d definitely we don't have a big long roadmap about what's happening in five years time or ten years time. And as you all know, technology is moving so fast. Um, there's new stuff coming out every single day. So we have our vision, and our vision is is that we want to be leading edge and we want to be early adopters and we want to avoid being too risk averse. So we give anything a go, as soon as we get a little notification in, in Slack, or Microsoft Teams, um, <laughs> we, from an RSS read from, from Microsoft, we're like, woohoo, let's give it a go. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, you know, we want all the data and we want to maximize usage of the data as well. So it's not just about reports and dashboards, it's surfacing our data up through bots. Um, through mobile apps, um, even through APIs. We have a bunch of APIs that um, researchers and students um, can, can access um, to do project work and research work and teaching work from. Um, strategy, probably the most important one, um, easy wins first. So low hanging fruit, we are pretty big into that, especially being a tiny little team. Um, and we don't do that whole log a job thing that drives me insane. So if somebody comes to us, um, that's in my mind our job to kind of log the job. Um, we have heaps of innovation time, so Friday, I'm here today, but Friday is normally kind of our, our geek day, um, where we just try things out. Um, on the documentation side, um, Microsoft Word is pretty much banned in our team. I do a little bit of it sometimes when I have to, but we do do documentation. It's just documentation that can be surfaced within our solutions. Um, we use the Agile methodology, but I've kind of adapted it slightly. I call it a stream Agile. Um, but it works pretty well for us. And um, I guess, yeah. Fantastic, Tim. I was just pleased I managed to get you to put stuff in PowerPoint for me, mate. So it's, it's awesome. It was a struggle. I got there. So, so I guess, as I said at the start of things, you know, we used to talk about the future, but to me, the future's landed. And, and I think if you look around and hear the stories you've seen today from other customers in New Zealand and some of the things that actually AUT has been doing for a couple of years now, I hope it prompts you to consider that idea of whether in two years' time you're going to overestimate what the impact of technology is on your business. 
And I'd encourage you to, as leaders, go out and be bold. Take some risks, put some table stakes down to find out what this can do for your business because we love working with the businesses that are doing that sort of thing. And as I said, it, it gives me a privilege because of the time I'm working in this environment where we are transforming the world because it's all happening at the moment. So go out there, good luck. And if you've got any questions with Tim and I, please pop them on Slido. Thank you.